but just let everybody uh, who's attending the uh, webinar just uh, just come in now for uh, maybe about a minute. Well, let's get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this, this webinar on space solar. Uh, I'm Mike Walls. I'm a professor of photovoltaics at Loughborough University. Uh, this is a hot topic, and uh, we have a galaxy of star speakers this afternoon for you. Before we start, I'd just like to draw your attention to some of the events we've got uh, planned in super solar over the next few months. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> actually next Tuesday, we have an event entitled Challenges for Indoor Photovoltaic Technologies, <clears throat> Internet of Things and all of that. And that will be chaired by um, David Lidsey from the University of Sheffield. Uh, then later in March, March the 31st, we've got uh, third in a series on New Horizons in PV using organic materials. And we're grateful to Neil Robertson with the University of Edinburgh for organizing and chairing that event. Um, going into April, we have research methods for PV. This is really aimed at uh, new entrants into PV and early stage career folk and uh, You'll see that we've got speakers from Australia all the way through to Colorado. So uh, our speakers have crossed seven, 17 time zones. And we're very grateful to uh, Taz Rahman of the University of Southampton for coordinating that. So that's 19th of April. Then, very on a topic very close to today's webinar, The Power of the Sun. This is actually in person. And it's at the University of Bristol. And uh, there's a link there uh, for that event. Then finally, <clears throat> we have the annual UK conference on uh, PV, PVSAT 17, which we're now combining with the Super Solar Conference. That will be at the Institute of Physics in London between 26th and 28th of June. And there are a number of places for students sponsored by Super Solar, but you better be quick because a lot of them have already gone. So uh, uh, with that, I'd like now to introduce our first speaker, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Landis, from who works with uh, the NASA Advanced Concepts. Uh, he's very kindly joined us at some very early time in morning in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, Jeffrey's talk is entitled Space Solar Power for Earth, Choice of Orbits. So over to you, Jeffrey. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, start screen sharing as soon as, uh, as soon as you're ready. Uh, here we go. Share. And uh, let's see, am I sharing? Do I have the right? Uh, just is this just going to. Uh, is this presenter uh, view or I can't tell? You just need to go into uh, slideshow mode, Jeffrey. Yeah. That's it. Okay. Perfect. So, yeah. Uh, so, thanks for inviting me to come talk. Uh, I'm 
assuming that most of you are pretty much familiar with the concept for satellite solar power, but uh, just a very, very brief review, is the idea is that we're converting uh, the electrical power that we get from solar cells to electromagnetic radiation, probably in the microwave uh, uh, wavelengths, beam it across free space, and the receiver will convert the electromagnetic radiation to electrical power. And in general, I won't be talking about that part. I will be talking about where to put such a, a system. The key uh, parameter that we really need to know is how big is that beam? And that's a very straightforward equation. Uh, this is the equation for the first zero of the airy pattern, assuming that you are producing an ideal beam. And this is actually set by the laws of physics. You really can't get a spot that's smaller than that first zero of the airy pattern. You can get something bigger if you want to, uh, but this is pretty much your physical limit. Uh, just a, a look at what that airy disk looks like. And outside of the, of the airy disk, the pattern falls off very quickly. Uh, but I have to note typical values for allowable human exposure to microwave radiation uh, come in at about the, oh, the 10 milliwatts uh, per uh, area so that surrounding the rectenna, you do need to have a keep out zone. Uh, fortunately, the area, area pattern drops down as an exponentially uh, e to the minus r squared. It looks like a Gaussian at large distances. So it drops off quickly, but something to keep in mind is that you do need to keep a keep out zone outside of your uh, rectenna. Uh, well, this is a big problem. Uh, this really sets the size of geosynchronous Earth orbit. And I should mention, I'll use that acronym uh, GEO a lot. So geosynchronous Earth orbit is a uh, long way away. It's 35,000 uh, kilometers altitude. So that at a typical wavelength of 2.45 gigahertz, a 12 centimeter uh, range, your spot size in kilometer is about 10.7 uh, divided by your transmit aperture in kilometer. So the thing to note is that we are really literally talking kilometer sizes here. That depends on your wavelength. Going up to higher wavelengths helps a lot, uh, but still even at uh, five or 10 gigahertz, we are talking systems that are kilometers in diameter. These are necessarily very large systems. Uh, and being large systems, they're only uh, economical if they are multiple gigawatts. And of course, the people who first uh, investigated solar power satellites for terrestrial power knew that. They talked about power satellites that were five and 10 uh, gigawatts of power. So you have to buy five gigawatts before you get even the first power uh, on the ground. Uh, a lot of interest is saying, well, let's go up to those high powers. Let's go up to 100 gigahertz. Uh, the problem is, as you go up to higher frequency, the atmosphere begins to hurt you. Uh, when you go up to much above uh, 20 gigahertz, you're going to be stopped by any sort of rain. Uh, when you go up to even higher values than that, you're going to be stopped even by the uh, atmospheric gases. So this ends up saying that uh, at 10 gigahertz, you, uh, you're a sunny day only. You can't operate if it's rainy. When you go up to a 100 gigahertz, you're going to need to put your receiver on a mountaintop because you can't even penetrate the thick part of the atmosphere. So typically, you're talking in uh, solar power satellite, the beam is going to want to be five, maybe 10 gigahertz, probably not much higher. So if you're looking for the question, uh, what can you do to make the system smaller? 
going up to higher frequencies will only gain you a little bit uh, beyond, uh, beyond a certain point. You're still going to need kilometer scale systems and hence gigawatts of power uh, in order to make the system uh, fit onto a, uh, a reasonable size. So that's always been the problem with space solar power is you really can't do anything useful at geosynchronous orbit without huge systems. So nobody wants to pay that uh, billions and billions of dollars uh, before you even get a single watt usefully received uh, on the ground. So that was really the impetus for this study, asking the question, well, is geosynchronous really the right place? Uh, is there another place we could do solar power satellites that didn't have to beam uh, such a long distance, uh, making it a, just orders of magnitude larger than any other uh, space system that's ever built? So uh, just a note, the problem with systems that are outside of uh, geosynchronous orbit is that a geosynchronous orbit satellite is uh, overhead or typically not overhead, typically at a uh, maybe a 30 or 40 degree angle from the zenith, uh, but it's stationary in the sky. So it's usable all the time. So something that we have to think about uh, is if you're not in that geosynchronous orbit, you're not in view all of the time. This particular diagram is for the case of visibility all the way down to the horizon, uh, but a, a similar calculation can be used if you have a allowable zenith angle. Typically, your allowable zenith angle is about 45 degrees. You have difficulty beaming uh, when your rectenna that's receiving the power is looking more than 45 degrees from the zenith. Uh, so, well, what we would really like to do is find a lower orbit that gives you a shorter distance to transmit. So can we do better? Well, uh, we don't get that 100% usage fra fraction once we get out of geosynchronous orbit. Uh, the low orbits are mostly out of view of the ground receiver. For example, if your uh, beaming satellite is at 1,000 kilometers, the visibility above 10 degrees, and that's awfully uh, sporty to hope that you can get uh, all the way up to a 80 degree off the zenith angle. But still, that's only 12.6 uh, minutes per orbit. Uh, so if we want to beam power to the people who have a lot of money to pay for it, uh, we're going to want to be beaming to non-equatorial sites. Unfortunately, if you put the low orbit uh, that's non-equatorial, you're only passing over the receiver once a day. Well, maybe for a good uh, positioning twice a day. And that utilization fraction is just a non-starter. You can't use a orbit that goes overhead for 12.6 minutes per day. Well, alternative is to give up the idea of serving those rich northern hemisphere markets and focus on the more power starved equatorial markets. So here's a thought. Uh, if we put the satellites into equatorial orbit, uh, we can put here a 13 satellite constellation that will serve receivers within 3,000 miles, uh, th sorry, 3,000 kilometers of the equator. So this particular one has a satellite uh, altitude of 1,500 kilometers, and you can see the beaming range of the 13 satellite constellation uh, in the circles. Uh, well, some difficulty here. Uh, the red circles are servicing only ocean. Uh, you can think about maybe you could do floating rectennas, but the 1500 kilometer long cables to beam, to uh, transmit the power from the ground to the land users are probably non-starters. 
as you can see, most of the receivers are going to be in pretty much what we'd call uh, underdeveloped countries. Uh, you could call this a bonus if you want, because these, of course, are a lot of countries that are very much power starved today. So you are servicing the people who most need power, but you're servicing the people who also have the least amount of money to pay for power. But there's sort of a flaw here. The number of satellites is going to be inversely proportional to the orbital altitude. I picked that 1500 kilometers kind of as a reasonable compromise between being high enough that you can beam a distance and uh, low enough that you're not beaming too far. So the diameter of the array on the satellite and receiver, assuming that you're making them both smaller, a smaller satellite and also a smaller receiver, means that your area is proportional to the altitude. So it means the minimum power per satellite is proportional to the altitude. It gives you the interesting uh, notion that the total amount of area in space and also on the ground is independent of the altitude. So in what we're doing in this particular case is instead of one huge satellite, we're now making lots of small ones. Instead of one huge receiver, we're making lots of small ones. But the total area we're putting in space, the total area we're putting on the ground is actually the same. Well, what's the advantage of that? Turns out, several possible advantages. Low orbits are easier to get to, so it might be easier to build such a constellation. It also might be easier and lower cost to replicate one satellite design 13 times rather than much a larger satellite that you're building just one of but has higher power. Uh, but in general, it turns out not to be terribly practical. Uh, it may not be economically feasible because it's a good idea to serve the market that has the money. Uh, many of your receivers are in the ocean. You're probably just going to not use the power that you're beaming down when the satellite can see nothing but ocean. Another problem is half of those satellites are in darkness. You're in such a low orbit uh, that the Earth's shadow is going to kill you. Uh, so all of these end up making the power uh, much more expensive. You're ending up getting about 35% of the use out of your satellite, counting for both the satellites that are in shadow and also the satellites that are over the ocean. Uh, it means that you're producing power mostly during the daytime. Turns out, actually, that's not a that's not much of a problem, as I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later. Uh, people mostly want power during the daytime. They're not uh, a whole lot of, of power uses during night. An interesting thought is that it may not be politically feasible. Uh, the underdeveloped countries tend to be a little bit cautious about anything that looks like the developed countries being uh, colonizing. And they're going to be saying, well, if this is so good, why are you developing this beam power solution where you're beaming power to us and not beaming it to yourselves? Uh, so some ideas probably won't work. This particular one looks like it has some advantages, uh, but economically, you're losing too much uh, of your power. Uh, one other problem for solar power satellites in low Earth orbit is this one. Uh, low Earth orbit is where there's a lot of debris. There's some debris up in geosynchronous orbit, uh, but the huge amount of space debris is in, in low Earth orbit. So the equatorial satellites are in some amount of risk uh, due to the vast amount of really basically just garbage that has sort of begun to accumulate. Uh, in the low Earth orbit. Well, here's another possibility. Uh, what if you say, no, we want to get our power to the Northern Hemisphere, where the richer users are, people are willing to pay for their power. Uh, 
this is a orbit that was discovered by the Russians, or the, uh, actually technically by the Soviets, uh, many years ago. It's called the Molnaya orbit. And this is a highly elliptical orbit, such that the perturbations by the Earth's equatorial bulge keeps that apogee over the northern hemisphere uh, and the perigee over the equator. Turns out this can happen only at an inclination of 63.4 degrees. Uh, since it's a highly elliptical orbit, most of the time the satellite is over that northern hemisphere and the, uh, the pass by the perigee, by the southern hemisphere, is, is very quick. Uh, in this particular uh, diagram, uh, zero indicates the perigee. It's a 12-hour orbit. So at about hours two all the way to hours 10, you're over a place where it's very easy to beam to that uh, northern hemisphere. Although you're biased at one side, you're either biased toward the Eastern hemisphere or the Western hemisphere. This has an apogee of 22,000 kilometers. So you're up at 62% of geosynchronous orbit. The nice thing about that is you get continuous sunlight. Uh, you're way up above the plane of the ecliptic. Uh, so you're not in the Earth's shadow except near that perigee portion. So if you're beaming to a particular Northern Hemisphere site and you want to beam to stuff that's roughly about 45 degrees uh, latitude, possibly higher, uh, you need at least three satellites to get continuous power to the Northern Hemisphere site. And I should mention that that apogee is not fixed with respect to uh, the, the noon to midnight line depending on what season it is during the year, sometimes that apogee of one orbit is over, <clears throat> over the dark side of the Earth, sometimes it's over the illuminated side of the Earth, and that will change uh, during the year. So, uh, well, so what are the advantages and disadvantages? It's an interesting concept, uh, but the need for three satellites cancels out that slightly closer beaming distance to give you really no real advantage. It puts your beaming in the Northern Hemisphere, that's good, uh, but it's still just as large a satellite system as the geosynchronous uh, Earth orbit system. Well, it might be interesting to talk about, can we design our satellites to sell to the peak power market instead of the baseload? Uh, that would increase the value of power produced uh, per kilowatt hour, just a, okay, just a, a note. Uh, this is one typical uh, demand curve for power. Uh, this particular one I think is New England and it's a, uh, a summer day. So you're getting high demand from about nine in the morning till about uh, oh, a little bit 10 o'clock at night or so. Uh, so you really want to sell power during this high demand time. And I'll, as I'll mention, this is today. Uh, the reason you want to do that is this is the price of power. Uh, you're really selling power for almost nothing uh, from times between about 11 p.m. until about, oh, really 7 in the morning when the power starts jumping up. Uh, and you're selling at peak power prices. So if possible, you'd like to find a satellite that could beam only to this time when you have high power and you don't really care uh, what happens during that sort of uh, midnight to seven in the morning time period. Well, this is for today, uh, but what happens when as solar cell prices get cheaper and cheaper, uh, we're getting more and more of our power uh, is coming from the sun. Uh, that is from terrestrial surface solar power. Well, this is an interesting curve. Uh, this is actually called a duck curve. So at the top here is the power requirements for uh, a typical day. And I have to say, this is a different market than the one I showed before. This one is a mostly residential uh, market. 
So there's a little bit of a peak of power in the morning, and then here's a higher peak. So people really want power in these evening hours between about seven and 11 uh, in the evening. So this is the power profile in 2012, but look at the interesting thing that happened when we went to 2013, when this particular market started using solar power uh, that was generated on the ground. So this amount of power here has now been supplanted by solar. And you can say as solar power increases, the amount of power that comes from the sun uh, is supplanting the requirements uh, pretty much between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. And the demand curve uh, now starts looking like this with the rather than a peak in the daytime, you now have a huge dip in the daytime. Uh, this curve is actually referred to in the solar industry as the duck curve because a, a lot of people think that the, the shape of this curve can, can be imagined to look like a duck. Well, what sort of orbit could you find that will give you that peak here in the evening uh, and maybe a peak in the morning too, a uh, little peak here, but a big peak uh, in the evening. You want a solar power satellite that beams uh, optimally uh, right about sunset is where you want that peak. Well, there are orbits uh, of that type. This is a sun synchronous orbit. So now we're using that uh, equatorial bulge to rotate the plane of the orbit. So it rotates about one degree a day. So as the earth moves around the sun at a rate of about one degree a day, the orbital plane rotates to follow it so that it's always in the dawn dusk. It's rotating more or less over the terminator. So in fact, it'll pass overhead at any given location uh, twice a day. And you can choose that so that the two uh, passes are uh, near sunrise and near sunset, uh, if you choose. Or you could buy us a little bit later. You could have it uh, pass overhead near uh, 9 p.m. if you want. It doesn't have to be a, a Terminator orbit. You don't want it to pass over uh, too much later than that because you do want it to remain in the, sun, the sunshine when you're passing overhead. Uh, well, here's an example. We put this at uh, a altitude of 1,681 kilometers. Uh, the reason for that is you want it in a two hour orbit so that the next day you pass over at the same time. If you were a little bit uh, later, you won't uh, pass over at exactly the same time the next day. So there's little or no eclipse at that. And if we assume the microwave beam can transmit to plus or minus 45 degrees of the nadir, that is, it doesn't have to be exactly down pointing. What happens is you get a 10 minute pass twice a day, once in the AM, once in the PM. If you get to a higher latitude, you can bias this to four passes a day. Actually, if you went all the way up to the equator, uh, you'd get 12 passes a day. Uh, sorry, all the way up to the pole, you'd get 12 passes a day. Probably not many users up at the pole. So if you want to cover a one hour of peak demand, uh, that would require six satellites. Well, probably still not a winner. Uh, now you're beaming only 3,500 kilometers. That's including both altitude and slant range. Uh, the satellite and receivers are now only a third of the area of, of a geoso geosynchronous orbit power satellite but you now need six satellites. They now cover only a one hour window, but that is the one hour window of peak demand. So you're selling for maximum power, but you're only using that constellation about 1.4% of the time at any one site. The useful thing is you could in principle cover as many as 70 sites across the earth. Uh, Realistically, three quarters of the Earth is ocean. You could cover 18 sites, and they aren't necessarily the, the optimally chosen sites. So this is one that's not likely to be economic in the near term. Uh, large number of satellites uh, 
low power per receiver. Uh, but it's a possible solution now for global solar power in the long term. It's a possible solution because it's not competing against terrestrial solar power. Uh, it's now supplanting terrestrial solar power so that the terrestrial power and the space power uh, both collaborate in order to give you power when the users want the power. Well, let's look even further in the future when presumably there's much more power uh, on the ground and look at an even more crazy idea. This crazy idea is what if we put a solar power in a halo orbit around the Earth's sun, uh, Lagrange point number two? Well, why would you want to do this? Well, if solar power becomes as cheap as some people forecast, and I remind you, it has to be pretty darn cheap before we can use it for space solar power. Uh, power will be mostly needed at night because during the daytime, we will have terrestrial solar power plants that are producing power. So the L2 point uh, is actually over the midnight side of the earth. Uh, we don't wanna be exactly in the midnight because that's the eclipse, we're in the shadow of the sun. But turns out there are multiple orbits that orbit around the L2 point and are never in the, the darkness. So we could put a satellite orbiting around the L2 point that could beam mostly to the night side. And turns out you can bias that beam. You can bias it and say, well, we're going to beam mostly to the evening and not, not to the morning. So that would mean that as the earth rotates, as the surface site comes past the evening point and into the darkness, we now get in view of the beam at, uh, from the satellite at L2. Well, there's one advantage. Uh, this is now giving you power when Earth solar is not available. But there's some interesting other advantages. Uh, it's a fixed direction of the beam relative to the solar panel. So the rotary joint, which turns out to be a big problem that allows the beam of microwaves to be decoupled from the incident solar uh, direction uh, becomes now irrelevant. Uh, there is no uh, rotary joint needed. In fact, you can fix the direction of the beam relative to the solar panel. So the earth is rotating under the satellite and you beam to ground locations as they uh, rotate into view. The difficulty now is that you're much, much further than geosynchronous orbit. You're now 1.5 million kilometers away from the point you're beaming to. That means that the satellites are no longer going to be uh, as small as say 10 kilometers across. They're going to be huge. So this is not practical in the near term. Uh, we've done exactly the opposite of what we wanted to do. Uh, we made much larger satellites, but on the other hand, this could be a solution for global power uh, in the long term. So <clears throat> I'd mentioned the simplicity of not having the rotational joint. Uh, this was a just a notional idea of what you could do uh, with a satellite that didn't have the, the rotational joint. Uh, you could use an inflatable uh, half metalized concentrator, and this would be simultaneously a solar concentrator allowing you to minimize the photovoltaic area and also a, uh, a radiator that uh, would be a dish antenna for the microwave beam uh, allowing you to get a pretty good uh, beam at that distance of 1.5 uh, million kilometers. So I'm not gonna go into a great detail about doing that design, which is still pretty much a, no, a notional design, but I'll just uh, link you to this particular technical report that uh, sort of talks about the advantages and the disadvantages. Uh, well, I was a 20 minute talk and I'm already a little bit over, but the quick summary is because of distance, geosynchronous orbit drives solar power systems to large sizes, 
hence geosatellites are necessarily high power. So it's expensive to get that first, uh, that first watt. And that has been a real barrier to implementing even testing beam power in space. Nevertheless, turns out the features of geo that make it superior are very much hard to beat. It's a stationary over the receiver. It gets 24 hours line of sight and very, very close to 24 hours of sunshine. So the bottom line is other orbits are not likely to be economic in the near term, sorry, but it's a possible solution for global solar power in the long term. So it might be thinking about uh, as we move to not merely doing one solar power satellite, but try to solve the global energy problem for the entire world. And in the long term, we are going to have to make that solution. It could be a, <clears throat> a reasonable way to, uh, to solve the problem. So uh, thank you. I guess I'll uh, stop sharing. And do we want to wait questions till the end or? Uh... No, I think we'll take some now, Jeffrey. So okay. thanks for a great talk. Uh, let me, I should have said, if, if anybody has a question, please put, the, put, put them in the Q&A and then I'll read them out to, to Jeffrey. I have a, <clears throat> a question myself, Jeffrey. I mean, I'm okay. a beginner in all this stuff. It would seem to me, it, it, it scares me a little bit that you're beaming so much power down to Earth via microwaves. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about aviation in particular. Mm -hmm. Are there any particular safety concerns? Oh, absolutely. Uh, when we start doing this, safety is going to rapidly turn into the single most controversial issue. Uh, there are many people who are very worried about uh, electromagnetic radiation even today. Uh, interestingly, the largest study ever done of the effects of microwave radiation at reasonable levels on uh, rodents uh, showed oddly enough that the rodents that were exposed to microwave radiation had longer average lifetime than the ones that weren't. Uh, this is an absolutely unexplained result. <laughs> I think we probably can't call this a, uh, a benefit, uh, but it's been a, an interesting thing. Uh, but, but human beings get the same effect, do they? <laughs> well, that's a good question. Uh, nobody has really volunteered to be the, the people exposed to radiation. So far, the only known adverse effects on humans are thermal effects. So if you're not in the beam long enough to heat up, there are no known deleterious effects. Uh, the problem is, well, what about the unknown effects? Okay. And I, I guarantee when we start doing this, a lot of people are going to, to bring that up. Okay. Uh, well, you've got loads of questions in the chat. Uh, I don't think we'll have time for all of them, but I'll, I'll yeah. see what we have here. So uh, I'll ask those questions I understand, I think I'll partially understand. In order to solve the diffraction frequency limit, why not use laser transmission with receivers located in low cloud areas. That's from Francois Buffenois. Yes, absolutely. That's a possible solution. Uh, we've also looked at that a lot. <laughs> uh, there's advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the disadvantage is that your end-to-end -end efficiency is a lot lower. Today, the best lasers are about 50% uh, energy conversion efficiency. So 50% of the electrical power in turns into laser light out. And uh, interestingly, the best receivers are about 50, maybe 60% efficient. So uh, whereas microwaves are up closer to 85, in the ideal case, even over 90% efficient. So now with lasers, you'd be talking about uh, end-to-end -end efficiency with a, a maximum of 25%. So you're losing a lot of your power. 
Uh, then you are getting some atmospheric losses as well. Uh, you know, even deserts have some cloudiness, some turbidity in the atmosphere. Uh, lasers now have more of a uh, health problem. And the health problem isn't actually that you're going to vaporize people. Yeah, you're not having that much power density. <laughs> it would be like being in the sunlight, really. Uh, the problem is people have a tendency to occasionally look up uh, and the, you really need laser protective glasses. So you seriously need to have a keep out zone. There are, however, people talking about using what's called eye-safe lasers. Uh, these are wavelengths above about 1.5 micrometers. They're not actually safe. You still don't want to look into them, but they're a lot safer than uh, visible light or near infrared lasers uh, in that the, uh, the eye itself is not transparent to the, the lasers. So the lasers don't hit the retina, uh, but they can still at high enough power cause uh, uh, blindness if you stare into the beam for a long time. Uh, but they're a lot, lot safer. Uh, we're looking at that a lot right now for the moon. Uh, we're really hoping that we can do a, a beamed power solution that makes sense for lunar applications. And in the back of my mind, my secret objective is I want to demonstrate beamed power in at least one application and in one place and show that it works. <laughs> so, so stay tuned. There's a heck of a lot of interest in beam power for the moon. Uh, maybe we'll get something going. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've got one from Mark Pickering. Uh, could the provision of equatorial SBS be funded partially through climate change mitigation finance from the developed world, both reducing global greenhouse emissions and providing green energy to climate impacted equatorial country. I would love to see that happen. The tremendous benefit of space solar power is exactly that. Uh, one way or another, sooner or later, we have got to stop burning fossil fuels. And it could be maybe ground solar plus storage. It could be space solar. It could even be wind, although the intermittency of wind has always bothered me a little bit. But somehow we've got to stop this. And when we stop it, we're going to have to solve the problem for the developing countries as well. Because we can't say, oh, yeah, well, we burned uh, billions of tons of carbon dioxide, but you can't because we, all, we already use that resource. No, we've got to solve the problem for developing world. So I absolutely am in favor of that, uh, that suggestion. Uh, with that said, in the, the government, what we say is that's above my pay grade. <laughs> I cannot <laughs> diplomacy and international finance problems. I really, really wish I could. Okay. Oh, I see another question underneath that, are my slides available? Uh, let me say uh, my email only requires that you need to know how to spell my name. <laughs> so I am jeffrey.landis at, uh, at nasa.gov. So uh, email me, I'll, I'll send you my slides. We've probably got time for another couple of questions. One is from an anonymous attendee. How does orbit congestion and end-of-life disposal impact the feasibility of the orbits? Yeah, that will indeed probably have to be something we think about. Uh, I think it's not going to be a problem because the solar power satellites have just huge amounts of power. So you could put an ion engine on them, and even if they're working at only 10% of beginning of life efficiency, that's plenty of power to put a high efficiency ion engine and uh, move them into a disposal orbit. Uh, so I think, it's, uh, I think it's not going to be a problem, but once again, that's going to be uh, something people are gonna need to talk about and, uh, and solve. I think nobody will let you put these up uh, unless you have a plan for what to do. 
uh, in the end. Okay, one from Stuart Irvine. How is the one kilometer plus microwave ground station collector going to be constructed? Yeah, it's an interesting question. It's a little bit wavelength dependent. Uh, the interesting thing about the rectanas is that in principle, they could be transparent. So <clears throat> I like the idea of in fact, putting them on top of the solar farm. So the rectana is not merely collecting microwaves, uh, but <clears throat> especially in these some of these cases where you don't have the beam 100% of the time, uh, when it's not collecting the microwave beam, uh, you can be collecting and converting solar energy. Uh, so that would be my solution. Uh, there are thin film rectennas that have been built and demonstrated with moderately high uh, conversion efficiency. So in principle, you could envision putting the thin film transparent rectennas uh, right over the solar arrays and have both of them work at uh, nearly uh, ideal efficiency. So that would be my solution. Uh, other people have suggested other things. A lot of people have said, eh, just make these uh, transparent, uh, put them over farmland or perhaps grazing land. You have multi, multi square kilometer areas that are used uh, simply to graze cattle or to graze sheep. And uh, the sheep don't care. <laughs> just, uh, they don't care if there's a rectangle overhead and making electricity, no. and they will just ignore it. So that would be my answer here. Okay, Jeffrey, we'll make one, one last question. I think, would you be kind enough to look at the uh, questions and answers and, and, and provide answers to those, those folks that we haven't asked the questions for? Uh, but I'll ask you one last one. Yeah. So this yeah. is from Robert Kennedy. How would the proliferation? Oh, hello. <laughs> Good to hear from you. Proliferation of tens of of uh, k of LEO satellites, e.g., Starlink, mm. handle the alternating unwave exposure. Yeah. For most of the orbits, I'm looking at. I think there won't be a conflict of actually right of way, we don't have to worry about who is, uh, uh, <laughs> you know, we're not gonna be colliding, uh, but frequency allocation is going to be a problem. The nice thing about solar power satellites is that we really just need one frequency. We don't need bandwidth, we just need a frequency. Uh, something to point out that will be a problem is that we are almost certainly going to be broadcasting harmonics. Uh, for example, if we're at five gigahertz, oh, it would be nice if we were exactly five gigahertz, uh, but we're definitely going to be also broadcasting 10, 20, et cetera, and probably actually odd harmonics too, probably 15 gigahertz. So we're, we're going to need to ask for all of these frequencies. Uh, as for, uh, you know, when the, their satellite crosses one of our beams, uh, are we going to damage them? Probably not. Uh, the fly past rates are so fast that there won't be a thermal effect because uh, they're moving this way, we're moving that way. And it's only a, a few seconds of, of exposure. Uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, we have really high power. We will certainly blow out their input amplifiers uh, <laughs> if, they, if they point at us. Uh, but they're not. Uh, they're pointing down. So if we fly overhead, assuming that they're reasonably uh, well-designed and, <laughs> and understand that they need to, uh, to not look directly into our beam, uh, it should be no problem. Uh, the real problem is going to be talking and getting the frequency allocations. Uh, and that is, I guarantee there will be a lot of arguments over that. Uh, because at our free, whatever frequency we pick, nobody else is going to be using that. Because, uh, like I said, uh, if they tried to use our frequency, they're going to be, uh, <laughs> they're going to be hurting because our power is just so high. Yeah. So they're going to need a filter to filter out the the five gigahertz or or ten gigahertz or whatever we end up being. Right. Will Thank be a problem. You. 
Thanks, Jeffrey. Well, you've excited a lot of interest. Please take a look at the Q and A. Okay. Well, we yeah. Are, well, we're going well, to have to move on. An interesting study, and I'm happy to uh, actually find ways to show it to some people who are interested. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Jeffrey. Right. We're going to move on now to Louise Hurst um, from the University of Cambridge, and Louise is going to talk about ultra thin PV for space based solar power. Over to you, Louise. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm just going to get my slides sharing now. Okay, so uh, can you see those? That's perfect, Louise, yes. Okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to speak to you about some uh, some work that we've been doing on ultra thin photovoltaics and uh, its potential application to uh, space based solar power. Um, so uh, the slides that I'll present today, it's it's the work of many people, as always, but I'd like to particularly um, uh, note contributions from Phoebe Pierce, Eduardo Camarillo Abad, Larkin Sayer and Armin Bartel. Uh, so I think a good place to start is to talk about the, the different applications of PV uh, and uh, the different metrics that we require for these different application spaces. So the three broad categories that we can kind of uh, bundle PV into are grid power. Um, so this is kind of utility scale. Um, for example, this solar power station here, uh, the 70 megawatt system um, in Flint, Wales, uh, covering this uh, vast area over 250 acres. Um, this is, of course, silicon panels. Um, these types of systems, uh, their primary metric that we're most interested in is the cost of producing the electricity. Uh, and baked into that number, well, there's the, the cost of the cells themselves, uh, then also the cost of install. Uh, the efficiency of the device, of course, is important to that, and how long we can leave it there generating electricity as well, so what its lifetime is. We care about a few other things too. We, we care about abundance and toxicity and also reliability, but mainly it, it's cost that's the real driving factor in our uh, decision about which technology to use for these applications. Uh, another category is remote power. So this could be anything from uh, a, a remote signaling beacon to a pocket calculator. Uh, but the application that I think is uh, generating a lot of interest uh, for the next decade or so is going to be vehicle integrated PV. Um, so this is going to require characteristics of our technology, uh, such as flexibility. We like things that we can form a nice conformal uh, coating on our vehicle with. Um, also specific power, so that's watts per gram. Uh, with a vehicle uh, uh, like the one that you see here, every gram counts. We also care about reliability and cost, but we're perhaps not quite so cost sensitive as we were in the case of utility scale generation. Uh, and then the other application uh, being space power. Uh, so the example I've, I've shown in the image here is the record breaking 60 square meter panel on uh, the NASA Juno mission. Um, some of the parameters we really care about for space applications are specific power. So that's again, this watts, watts per kilogram, which includes the efficiency of the device and also the, the mass of the array. Uh, but we also care about radiation tolerance. So these arrays are going to be bombarded by uh, energetic uh, particle radiation. And um, we need to make sure that they're going to be able to still power their payloads at the end of their lifetime, at the end of the planned mission lifetime. Um, we do care about cost for space. Um, but traditionally, uh, or historically, I should say, we've been less sensitive to cost uh, than in the case of utility scale. Uh, so where does space-based solar power fit into this map? Well, it doesn't really fit into any one of these boxes conveniently. Um, it actually has its own unique set of criteria, uh, which is really the reason why we need to think about developing new technologies uh, that can um, deliver an economic result for us. So one of the things is that um, we are uh, very cost sensitive, certainly partly because of the scale that we're going to be producing this on. Um, uh, but we also care rather than about um, having sufficient power for a, a payload over a given lifetime, as would be, be usually the case for space applications, we actually care about our lifetime yield. Yeah, so the uh, uh, production of electricity over the whole lifetime of the system. So it's a slightly different set of equations that we're looking at. Uh, and that leads us to uh, a different set of solutions. 
Um, so just to put some numbers to this, um, so this is looking at cost and how much of a significant factor this is. This is quite um, a, an approximate set of calculations. It's looking at a complicated system and, and trying to simplify it down, really to just give us uh, an order of magnitude view of what's going on. I think there's a lot of space for more research on uh, a full techno-economic analysis of PV for space-based solar power specifically. Uh, but this hopefully gives us an idea. Um, so these are uh, um, a set of numbers calculating the cell manufacturing costs and launch costs um, for a 40 megawatt system. For those of you on the call that are familiar with the SEI, this is the phase two system, the 40 megawatt system. Uh, so it's not far off, actually, in terms of this area. It's not far off the um, uh, the, the area of this um, this 70 megawatt system that is in Flintwell. So we're talking about covering a massive area uh, by necessity in order to, to generate that kind of power. And these numbers are based on a, a device that is a, a real workhorse of the industry. Uh, these were uh, Azure cells that were triple junction, 3.5 on, on germanium. Uh, and the, the costing is done using a, a recent NREL techno-economic analysis, uh, for, which, is, uh, which says that we have about uh, a production cost of about $40 per watt. We can see that with those values, if we're wanting to get 40 megawatts, we're going to very quickly end up in the billions kind of price tag. This is really too high for us to, to consider this an, uh, an economically valid solution. Um, and so looking to bring that cost down is going to be significant. Um, if we look at this uh, techno-economic analysis, uh, uh, there is a pathway to reducing these costs, uh, still based around uh, the same kind of cell technology, the 3.5 the technology. Um, that is kind of a, a there's, there's many aspects to that, uh, one being uh, uh, reuse of wafers, uh, but also looking towards lower cost um, epitaxial methods. Um, developing those methods, but also scaling those methods within uh, within industry too. So, um, but what's predicted is that um, two orders of magnitude reduction in costs could be achieved uh, with these measures. So there is hope for the future in terms of cost reduction of the epitaxy if there was demand for it. Um, then if we look at launch costs, so this is based around the, uh, the cost of launch for Falcon Heavy, uh, around $1,400 uh, per kilogram. Uh, interestingly, this is pretty much an order of magnitude less than we'd have been looking at even a decade ago. So costs have come down dramatically uh, in recent years, which is, of course, excellent for what we're trying to achieve here. Um, but we're still looking at the hundreds of millions kind of price tag to launch um, a kind of the, just the cells. This is only for the calculation of the cells to launch a 40 megawatt system uh, and its associated um, uh, cover glass for protection from radiation. Uh, this particular protection from radiation uh, was calculated for a 80% uh, remaining factor in a highly elliptical orbit for 10 years. Um, so we'd definitely like to be able to reduce that down as well. Um, there are pathways to doing this. So um, uh, one of them might be to look towards uh, technologies that are inherently radiation resilient. That's one of the approaches that we're looking at. Uh, and the particular technology we've been developing is the ultra thin cell. And I'll talk about the data from that in a little bit. Um, but that could potentially bring down uh, bring down the cost of, uh, of launch significantly because we are reducing the weight down so much. Something that I think is worth mentioning here as well is the potential role of uh, concentrator systems. Um, the reason why is I know that that's been a focus, particularly in the UK scene, there's been a lot of talk about that, uh, and I thought it was worth addressing what that can do. Uh, very simplistically, we could say, oh, well, let's let's put a 20 times concentrator on it, and then we've reduced down the cost uh, 20 times of launching that cell and also reducing down the cost of manufacturing that cell. Um, it's not quite true, because, of course, we've, we've actually transferred those costs from the cell into the array and we've transferred that weight from the from the from the cell into the array as well so uh we definitely need to do a more more sophisticated analysis rather than just reducing by 20 times but there's definitely a lot of scope there uh for improvement however by using a concentrator system we int necessarily introduce complexity and complexity is not free. Uh, it's not free for terrestrial applications and it's not free uh, for space applications. That's for sure. If we can do something in a simple way uh, with fewer moving parts, uh, then we would we'd definitely like to do that. Um, so 
And I, I will just, for those of you with long memories will know this tale already, but this is the cautionary tale of CPV. <laughs> um, so back in the early 2010s, CPV was a fully commercialized technology for terrestrial use cases. And um, there were uh, 100 megawatt installed annual capacity, um, which was a, a big portion at that time. Um, and so it really seemed set to be a success in the future. And that's because it was uh, actually cost advantageous at that time relative to silicon. Uh, but in the years that followed, we saw big reduction in the price of silicon modules, uh, which is what you can see on the chart down here, which really uh, wiped out that cost advantage. Uh, and the inherent complexity um, and large scale of the CPV systems made them uh, less attractive for investment, uh, much more risky um, um, systems, um, whereas silicon uh, was, was less risky, it was cost competitive, and, and therefore viewed as bankable. And, and that's the big success story of silicon. So it's a cautionary tale for people saying, oh, well, we'll just make it CPV, and, and, and therefore we can reduce the costs. Well, well, maybe, but it's a, a more complicated picture than that, certainly. Uh, although as a physicist, I do uh, feel that CPV is a, is a sleeping giant uh, waiting to return because of the fundamental efficiency advantages it can offer. Uh, although in the future, CPV systems may look a little bit different to how they did uh, back in 2012. Uh, okay, so moving on to another aspect of this new paradigm for space-based solar power. Now, fortunately, our first speaker has given a really very insightful uh, view of, of the different types of orbits that may be available. Uh, but one of the things we also need to think about with different orbits is that we may have different radiation profiles, in fact, very different radiation profiles, um, uh, which is uh, what you can see plotted out here. These are Spenvis calculations, so integral proton flux as a function of energy. Uh, where we have uh, a Starlink uh, low Earth orbit here, um, and orbits like the Molniya orbit, uh, orders of magnitude um, higher. Um, and I think there's definitely a discussion to be had around where, what may be the, the most suitable environment for a lot of different reasons, but uh, certainly if we're going to look to go to these highly elliptical type orbits, uh, radiation is going to become an increasing challenge that we need to face, particularly because our lifetime energy yield is going to be such a significant factor uh, in terms of the economics of our system. If we can leave it up there for twice the time, then um, we can uh, produce twice the energy and um, bring down those costs by a half. Uh, so uh, the plot here you see at the bottom uh, kind of exemplifies uh, the challenge we have with highly elliptical orbits. This is showing displacement damage dose as a function of cover glass thickness. This is the 10 years in a HEO orbit, all the way up here, uh, versus 10 years in a LEO orbit. So uh, the LEO orbit being significantly lower in terms of displacement damage dose. Um, and then if we just slot in here, this is uh, the damage dose that we would have for in this particular calculation was done for the ZTJ cell, which is very similar to the Azure cell in terms of design, um, another workhorse of the industry um, for the 80% remaining factor of this device. We would need about 50 times more uh, protective cover glass uh, to operate this system in a highly elliptical orbit than we would in a LEO orbit. And of course, uh, that directly impacts on cost uh, because it's the cost of launch of the cover glass that we would be most concerned with. Um, so uh, in order to be able to utilize orbits that have uh, a better coverage, uh, reducing down our number of satellites and as, as we've just heard from the first speaker, that may or may not be an advantage, but if that was the route uh, that proved uh, best from the economics perspective, then we would need technologies that um, are inherently radiation resilience, resilient. It wouldn't necessarily be practical to just coat them with more and more glass uh, because of course you're increasing mass. And of course we would want to go for much longer than 10 years. We would want um, lifetimes 20 years plus. Um, for, for these types of systems. Okay, so the system that we have been developing uh, is the ultra thin geometry. Um, the way that this works is that uh, in, in solar cells standardly, radiation induced, induced defects degrade the solar cell performance. The main mechanism by which they do this is that they reduce minority carrier diffusion length. And so you get a reduction in, uh, in charge carrier extraction and a reduction in current. Um, what the ultra thin geometry does is that uh, it allows us to extract those charge carriers before they recombine. Uh, 
And you can uh, understand that by looking at uh, the graph here, where we have normalized short circuit current as a function of three MeV proton fluids. And the red line here is the 80 nanometer device. And then you have 800 and 3,500 nanometer devices. So uh, orders of magnitude thicker. And in the case of the 80 nanometer device, we see this really fully flat profile, which, which is fantastic. That's what we want. The problem with the 80 nanometer device is, is really exemplified in the lower chart here, showing short circuit current um, uh, as an absolute value, so rather than a normalized value. And we can see that its starting performance is much, much lower than these thicker devices. And that's because we're having a lot more transmission, even in highly absorbing gallium arsenide, which is what these cells are. Um, with 80 nanometers, you only absorb about 10% of your light. So um, we need to compensate this absorption in order to get high efficiency. Uh, so this was work that we published back in 2016. And uh, I thought I'd just take a brief moment uh, to mention that this was, I was doing this work back when I was at uh, Naval Research Lab, working with Phil Jenkins, late Phil Jenkins. Some of you may have worked with him over your career, so I thought it was, it was good to just highlight his contribution to this work as well. Okay, so what have we been done, what have we gone and done in, in the preceding times, so in the time that's followed, um, uh, that first publication. Well, we wanted to address this beginning of life performance issue to get up the performance of our 80 nanometer cells so we could benefit from good efficiency, but also longevity in high radiation environments. Um, and we stuck with the 80 nanometer geometry, uh, but to improve that beginning of life performance, we uh, adapted some of its features um, to make it a good device on the nanoscale, because making a diode on the, on that's only 80 nanometers thick is actually a little bit tricky. Um, we also uh, integrated it with a nanophotonic structure. So this is taking it off of its original growth wafer and integrating it with a, a, a light management system in order to make the device still electrically thin, but optically thick so that we could absorb all of our incident uh, solar illumination. Um, so I should mention this was a collaboration with IQE and the University of Bath, and it was a, a work that was funded by ERC, UK Space Agency, and Isaac Newton Trust. The way we approached this was to use a technique called displacement Talbot lithography. We think this was the first time that this technique has been applied to photovoltaics, but um, this uh, was what we used to create our nanophotonic structure, uh, which is actually a difficult thing to do at the wafer scale to produce uh, feature sizes that are on nanoscale. Um, but this particular technique allows us to do it in one single exposure with pitch size here um, of about uh, um, uh, 500 nanometers. Uh, this is a, a full four inch wafer just with a, a, a single exposure that you can do this technique with. So it, it's uh, a big advantage over any kind of direct bright technique that would be an alternative. And here are the results that we were able to produce. So um, in the yellow, you see an on wafer equivalent. So this is the device without the light management. And you can see you get this very poor uh, external quantum efficiency in this near IR region. Uh, that's the part of the, uh, the spectrum where the absorption coefficient is low. Uh, and so uh, this is really where we've got a lot of uh, our loss going on. This is the part that we need to enhance. So we did um, uh, this off-wafer device fabrication for the nanophotonic structure with the displacement tablet lithography. We also tried it with um, uh, planar silver geometry as well. Uh, and we were able to um, increase absorption in this near IR region a lot. And you can see the various um, peaks that come from uh, various resonances here. Um, so if you're interested in the photonics aspect of this, then uh, do go and check out this paper. Um, so that's a big advantage in terms of um, uh, boosting that solar absorption. Um, but how does it do in terms of light IV? So uh, these are the light IV curves um, for the on wafer device, that's in yellow, and then the uh, uh, the planar silver and then anaphotonic. So both of the um, off wafer devices uh, here. So this was AM0 char characterization with 10% uh, shading loss and no anti reflection coating. Um, relative to the on wafer device, our integrated light management gave us an increase in short circuit current of about 53%, which was a, a really uh, very significant boost. Um, it also gave us a, a very significant boost in terms of voltage, so uh, a much more efficient device that we were producing here. Um, slightly frustratingly, though, you may say, well, your planar silver 
device, uh, planar silver light management is as efficient as the nanophotonic case. Um, that wasn't what we were targeting, um, but uh, we were able to, so why would you bother to go to, <laughs> to go to the effort of producing nanophotonic structures if just planar mirrors will do the job? Uh, well, actually, uh, the answer is uh, that, uh, which our simulation later showed, uh, that you can get nanophotonic advantage, but you just have to be very specifically targeted at the right kind of length scales. So had we gone to a slightly longer pitch of around 600, had we had more time to develop our fabrication process to get exactly the right ratio of kind of a disk radius to a matrix material, um, we would have been able to produce a significant uh, advantage with uh, the nanophotonic structure over the planar mirror. But as it stands, um, the improved uh, nanophotonic structure uh, versus uh, our measured device, this was from about 9% efficiency up to around 16% efficiency. So uh, still uh, a big improvement, um, but uh, further to go if we're wanting to get up to the kinds of efficiencies that we see with uh, state-of-the-art um, photovoltaics for space applications. So just to bring you back full circle with this, um, we took these um, uh, devices that were ultra thin and we knew to be radiation resilient and we integrated them with the, uh, with the light management system to try and boost that beginning of life performance. Then we took them back and we did these same radiation exposures again. Uh, and here are the results of that. So we've got um, our 80 nanometer device here. Uh, the green uh, represents also 80 nanometer devices, but these are our optimized devices. Um, however, without light integration, light management uh, integrated. So the advantage that we've got here, the boost is purely because we optimized the diode characteristics. We then went ahead and integrated uh, the light management as well. And we were able to produce 80 nanometer cells uh, that essentially had a beginning of life performance, which was as good as the 800 nanometer cells. So the devices that were an order of magnitude thicker, um, yet they retained their properties of uh, longevity in um, these um, uh, particle radiation environments. Uh, so this is really what we are trying to achieve. Uh, clearly a lot more work to do in this area on scaling the technology, uh, but the fundamental basis uh, would enable us to uh, utilize orbits uh, that may have high radiation environments and enable very long missions in those environments, um, such as those that would be required to make space-based solar power uh, an economic choice. Uh, so conclusions and outlook. Uh, so PV for space-based solar power has a unique set of requirements. It's distinct from terrestrial utility scale and also distinct from other space applications. We're very interested in cost, both of the cell and of the launch. Uh, and we're also very sensitive to lifetime energy yield, which is a little different um, uh, to other uh, space PV missions. The ultra thin devices we're working on offer intrinsic radiation resilience, but as we reduce down the device thickness, we need to worry about transmission losses. And that's where light management uh, can come in. But ultimately, we may find there's a trade-off there between lifetime, are you going to thicker devices and improving efficiency, um, and um, the, um, sorry, uh, the lifetime and, um, and uh, beginning of life performance. Um, so with the tuning factor there being uh, the device thickness. Um, but all of these thoughts uh, ultimately feed into this idea of what is the exact environment that we want and um, our need to design our devices specifically for that environment. So it's this kind of systems level thinking for space-based solar power right at the discovery research stage uh, to yield much more effective solutions. Okay, thanks very much. Great. Thanks, Louise. Um, <clears throat> I've got a quick question. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> so PV would still require glass cover sheets going into space. Uh, has anybody considered using a polymer alternative? Yes, and I, I'm hopeful one of our later speakers might even talk about that, but we'll, we'll wait and see. <laughs> yes, certainly. There's a there's a difficulty there because you're not going to get the same level of protection, right? That, it's, that There's this relationship between the mass. Inherently, there's a relationship between the mass from a sort of material science perspective, the mass of the, the protection and its ability to block uh, the incoming radiation or absorb the incoming radiation. So um, it, you can't completely escape that by just going to a different type of materials 
class. But yes, um, you, you could think of other types of protection. And, and actually, you're always going to likely need some kind of protection, but it, it may be a very, very thin uh, sort of several tens of microns kind of dielectric layer protection. These are other things that people have, have thought about if your layer underneath is inherently radiation resilient. Okay, we've got a question from David Humphrey. Louise, great presentation. Uh, how well does your thin film PV cope with non-uniform illumination? Perfection in big structures is difficult. Mm -hmm. Have you any thoughts on other methods, processes that could be deployed to make your PV more accepting of non-uniform illumination? So I think this PV will be uh, very accepting of non-uniform illumination, unlike other types of um, uh, thin film PV actually. Um, so indeed in the lab, we don't always illuminate it uniformly. We'd often uh, excite it with a laser just in one little corner and then move it around. Um, I think this type of thin film is not gonna suffer from the same type of defects um, just because of the nature of the material. Yeah, so non-uniform illumination is not so much of a challenge um, for, for three fives. Okay, now, Thomas Santicalilio has asked several questions. I'll ask the easy one. Uh, and if perhaps if you could go back and, and take a look at the, the other questions he's asked. Uh, and what he's saying is, can transmission be integrated into separate matrix on board the cell? Can transmission yeah. be be integrated. I'm not sure I actually quite understand the question. Um, sorry, I'm, I may be- oh, It's followed up with saying, can you literally 3D print Sapphire, so whatever? Power, power transmission to earth, I think he's saying. I think maybe if you go back into the yeah. Q&A, Louise and- uh, Yes, uh, I can maybe take a look at those. Yeah. Yes. One, one yeah. from Robert Kennedy. Are you interested in the possible application of aerographene in an ultra low aerial density structural substrate? I think that's a great idea. So th like the calculations that are often we see quoted for specific power with, with thin films don't always include a substrate. I think we need to acknowledge that a substrate of some form will be needed when you're looking at a device that's 80 nanometers. Um, but absolutely, it could be something that's very, uh, very lightweight um, and is really there just to provide some structural support for, uh, for the film. So um, yes, it, it could be something that's much lighter weight than the native substrate, for example, which is um, a dense material okay i think we've got time for one last question this is from an anonymous attendee how does the trade-off between lifetime and transmission apply to multi-junction versus single junction cells uh yeah that's a really that's a really good question actually this is an area of research that we're going to be working on over the next year or so so we're going to be unpicking this further um but one thing that uh is, is definitely the case with the ultra thin geometry is that you're maintaining your um, your current, right? So if you maintain current, you don't necessarily need to worry about um, the uh, change in performance of subcells over the lifetime of the device. So current workhorse um, space technologies are engineered very specifically um, for the sen more sensitive cells um, uh, to ensure that they are protected up to a certain point, at which point the efficiency drops off when you lose your current matching. Um, current matching as a, a changing feature with radiation degradation is less of a worry with the ultra thin concept because we uh, are going to be maintaining current. Yeah, that makes sense. So we only need to match it once <laughs> and it should stay more or less that way. Okay, great, Louise. Well, we're going to have to move on, I'm afraid, but if you could take a look at the Q&A, please. Okay, great. So next up, we've got uh, Dan Lam from Swansea University. And Dan's going to talk about from lab to a low, low Earth orbit, cadmium telluride in film solar cell flight test. Thanks, Mike. I think I just need that one to stop yeah. screen sharing so I can start. Uh, Louise. Louise, if you can stop sharing.
Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you, Super Solar, for this invitation. I'd like to talk to you about some work we've been doing with Camion Telluride. Uh, so we've been working with Camion Telluride for a number of years now, and we saw that it might have an application in space, and we started to do some research around that, and then we were lucky enough to get a flight test, which is kind of the ultimate goal for anybody working on a, on a space technology. So I'd like to just share that journey with you. Uh, I'm in the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Swansea University, and a lot of this research I'm going to talk to you about has been heavily supported by Professor Stuart Irvin from Swansea and Professor Craig Underwood from the University of Surrey. And we've been funded by the European Regional Dep Development Fund and the UKRI through uh, EPSRC. We're actually just in the process of moving into a new laboratory into the Centre for Integrative Semiconductor Materials the SISM building, and this is a new building on the Bay campus. And this is gonna house our oxide and chalcogenide MOCVD facility. And the jewel in the crown for this facility is this egg strong close coupled shower head MOCVD system you can see on the screen here. This can take two to four inch wafers or a five centimeter square of glass. You can see the susceptor down here. And on this system, we're going to grow gallium oxide, transition metal dichalcogenides, oxides, and emitters for photovoltaics. And then in the rest of the lab that you can't see, we've got some of our legacy MOCVD tools that deposited the cadmium telluride and the transparent conducting oxides I'm going to talk about in this presentation. I've also got at the bottom of the slides um, some sort of further information, some links to further information if you're interested. So thin film cattel, appreciating you're all uh, up on your on your solar cell technologies, but it's a polycrystalline material. The active layers are about four microns thick. It's got a really good band gap for PV of 1.45 EV and a theoretical maximum efficiency of 30%. Uh, historically, the record efficiencies of, of cadmium telluride, I've plotted them here on this graph and you can you can get a lot of this information from, from Martin Green's solar cell efficiency tables from progress in photovoltaics. You can see back in the early 70s, uh, it was around 6%, gradually increasing with a plateau from the late 90s to about 2012 at 16.5%. And then another concerted effort to bring the efficiency up to 22.1% in about 2016. And it has plateaued there at 22.1% for the uh, best laboratory cell efficiency. But the cadmium telluride community believe there's a very clear pathway to achieving 25% efficiency, primarily by boosting the VOC. So this record cell has a VOC of 887 millivolts. Uh, it's believed that we can get to, to one volt uh, VOC and get up to 25% efficiency, which of course is important when you're talking about solar cells for space. Uh, first Solar are uh, uh, the um, market leaders for cadmium telluride manufacturing. They actually have the largest share of thin film solar cell manufacturing in the world. And by 2026, they'll be producing 21 gigawatts per year. They sell into the utility market. So large area applications such as this massive solar field here. This is a gigawatt scale solar field and solar parks. And of course, cadmium telluride follows the super straight configuration. So we start with uh, a transparent substrate. Um, upon that, we put a transparent conducting oxide, then uh, N-type emitter layer, then the P-type cadmium telluride, and then some metallized back contact. And you can see the glass that we use is typically sort of three millimeter uh, soda lime glass. So why CADTEL in space? Well, previously there was one attempt to put cadmium telluride uh, solar cells in space. That was back in 1994, the Strive 1B mission. They put 47 test cells into space, uh, a couple of which were cadmium telluride. But unfortunately, that mission didn't communicate any uh, data back to Earth. So we didn't have any previous results of CADTEL PV in space. But in the literature, a lot of the cadmium telluride research groups have 
radiation tested their material and found it to be highly radiation tolerant uh, compared to multi-junction and silicon solar cells for space, uh, two orders of magnitude more radiation tolerant. And this will give you a high end of lifetime efficiency. So you're not, your cell's not so affected by the radiation in space. So your end of life efficiency can be much closer to your beginning of life. Because we can put uh, the cadmium telluride onto a transparent substrate, we can have a, a high specific power if we choose a substrate that's much thinner than the three millimeter glass. And, and that's really gonna be the premise of this talk. So there's a real good potential for the, a very high specific power from cadmium telluride. And also if we choose a thinner substrate, it could be flexible. So we could roll it up for stowage in the spacecraft and unroll it uh, with new sort of deployment mechanisms in space. And then I think cadmium telluride could offer a very low cost per watt. It's, it's with, with the, the work, the manufacturing sector in cadmium telluride, it's been proven that the cost per watt can be really brought down. So the sort of applications we're looking at would be large area applications that took advantage of this high specific power, uh, this radiation hardness and you know the low cost because it's a large area. So things like solar electric propulsion and the space-based solar power that's been talked about. Uh, lunar and Martian bases, they'll require solar cells to be um, transported there and rolled out to provide the power for the base and certain high radiation missions. So our innovative step, well, Louise already mentioned this, the cover glass that is ubiquitously um, laminated onto most solar cells that go into space. And that's the majority of that is actually made at Keoptic Space Technologies, now owned by Excelitas Technologies. And they were a company just down the road from our previous lab. And we've been collaborating with them since on this particular project since 2012, uh, using their cerium dope cover glass, 100 microns thick, which offers a really good barrier to electron and proton irradiation and doesn't darken, it doesn't form the color centers that normal glass would form in the sort of high UV uh, radiation environment of the, of, the, of the space. We decided, could we put our solar cell directly onto the cover glass instead of onto the normal solar line glass, glass and thus moving, removing the step for having to laminate cover glass to your solar cell after you've made it. We used our MOCVD technique to put the cadmium telluride onto 100 micron glass. And we were the first to report and publish on a thin film solar cell directly onto the cover glass. So now we're offering a huge weight saving and we're building in the radiation hardness of having the cover glass. And this is our structure here, uh, the 100 micron cover glass, uh, aluminium doped zinc oxide TCO, our cadmium sulfide window layer and our cadmium telluride absorber layer. We did some radiation testing on this uh, material and which is potentially 100 times more radiation hard than other space PV. Uh, Craig did some shroom simulations, so stopping a range of ions in material simulations. And what you normally do is you, industry standard would be to irradiate with something like 10 mega electron volts of protons. But this will mostly just pass through the glass in your device. So what Craig did is he dialed in an energy that would have the maximum absorption and damage in our semiconductor layers. And we illuminated from the cadmium telluride side rather than from the, um, through the cerium doped glass. And you can see when you model for the different densities of our materials, 0.5 mega electron volts does have this nice kind of absorption and stopping in our layers. So using the Surrey Iron Beam Center, the, uh, some samples were irradiated with different proton fluences. So uh, different number uh, amounts of protons per centimeter squared. And you can see here the Perspex sample holder that we held our sample in has yellowed under the proton beam. There was no visual change to the uh, cadmium telluride layers and the shirt cells showed little degradation up to a proton fluence of one times 10 to the 13 centimeter squared. And you can see, you know, this is intentionally trying to do the maximum damage to the cells. So a really thorough testing. We also uh, 
put our cells in for some electron testing. So using one mega electron volts of electrons at one times 10 to the 15 per centimeter squared, we saw a very slight overall uh, reduction in efficiency. So a relatively four, a relative 4% reduction in efficiency using that industry standard test. And then just to say, we did some thermal shock testing because uh, solar cells in space are subject to very rapid uh, temperature changes when they go in and out of eclipse. So we uh, put our solar cells into liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees C for a minute, pulled it out to 80 degrees C, and then cycled this backwards and forwards, testing the performance before and after. There was no change to performance. And there was no visible signs of delamination. And using the scotch tape test, no delamination was seen there. So we, we'd sort of... Uh, come to a point now where we really needed to do some 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 more thorough testing and what better testing can you do than putting your experiment into space and in 2015 the UK and Algerian space agencies agreed a joint mission which included a three unit CubeSat and the CubeSat was designed to provide training to the Algerian students um, the great thing about CubeSats is they're very affordable so it really brings uh, the affordability to people like us in uh, universities of getting our experiments into space. And a CubeSat is a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. You can build them up into a number of units. And this outside nano mission that we were involved in was a three unit CubeSat. It was a comp, um, the payloads were competitively chosen. So we were lucky enough to, to win a spot on the CubeSat along with two other payload providers. And the CubeSat was built in the Surrey Space Centre, and this is the mission patch here. So we've been working in the lab, making uh, lab-based solar cells. We suddenly had to start thinking about how we're gonna make a solar cell that is robust enough to go into space and can be measured as well. So we can, we can get the data from it. And we only had nine months to do this. So we had a lot of really good partners on the right-hand side here, you, side, you, you can see their logos here. So we had a lot of really good advice there. And what we did is we laminated our solar cell onto a PCB board where we could make uh, connections to the cells. We had four one centimeter strip cells here and a common front contact. So we built in some redundancy here in case one of the cells failed. And on the back, we had a LM35 temperature sensor. So we could get the temperature of the uh, back of the solar cell for each measurement. In parallel, Craig and his team were designing the software and the circuitry needed to, to, to measure these solar cells in space. So it was a real team effort. We made the solar cells, Craig made the uh, software and the uh, electronics that enabled the measurement and the communication back to the spacecraft and then back down to Earth. We had to learn quite a lot about documentation required for spacecraft, uh, critical design reviews and uh, specification sheets for each of the uh, engineering qualification models and the flight models that we delivered. So it was, it was a really steep learning curve, but really great fun. Uh, here's a CAD drawing of the Outside Nano. You can see our thin film come into my payload here. And these are the standard multi-junction solar cells that actually provide power to the spacecraft. So uh, there's a photo on the insert there of the final Outsat Nano 3 unit CubeSat. And this was launched from the Satish Darwin Space Center in 2016. It was put into a low earth orbit, about 680 kilometers. Uh, and in that orbit, it uh, circles the earth every 90 minutes and it's an eclipse for about 38 minutes of those 90 minutes. Uh, so this is another nerve wracking moment. You've got your experiment on a rocket going into space. Uh, will, it, will the rocket work? Will it get deployed? Will it send measurements back? Yes, it did. So we got the first reported data in January, 2015 from a cadmium telluride solar cell in space. So here I show you the uh, IV curve. You can see all four cells were working. The illumination was about 70% here. So this uh, CubeSat is slowly tumbling. And when you ask it to do a survey of the solar cells, uh, you can't be confident of 
exactly the orientation to the sun. So you ask it to do a number of surveys and hopefully you get a survey that's got a pretty decent illumination. So here we've got 70% and the cell temperatures were four degrees Celsius. Now, um, some seven years on, it's still working. It's completed about 37,000 orbits of the Earth. Uh, you can see here, I've got data from 2017 all the way through to last November. And uh, again, these IV curves are being influenced by the varying levels of illumination of each survey. Um, but what we can say is there's, there's no signs of delamination. The uh, transparent conducting oxide has held up really well. The When you can get the same illumination, you see that the short circuit hasn't changed over these seven years. What is changing is the shunt resistance. There is some shunting being introduced to the cells now. And we think we can explain that because we use gold as a back contact for these cadmium telluride cells. Gold's really useful in the lab for cadmium telluride. It makes a lovely ohmic contact to the cadmium telluride, but it is known to be a diffuser in cadmium telluride and it will work its way down to the junction and can give you micro shorts. So we think that's what's been happening with the cells in terms of this reduction in shunt resistance. You can't quite tell here, but series resistance has remained pretty stable since the, the cells went up. So what would we like to do next with this, uh, with this cadmium telluride tele technology? Well, of course, we'd like to develop a new back contact structure and there are alternatives to gold. Uh, we, we just need to um, investigate that and then we can solve that uh, gold diffusion issue. We're also looking at low level concentration to increase the power. So we're using Fresnel lenses here. This is a AM 1.5 solar simulator shining through a Fresnel lens, which is focusing the light onto the cadmium telluride below. And some unpublished data, when we use a Fresnel lens that gives a 3.5 times sun at AM 1.5, we can get a threefold increase in power from our cadmium telluride. So there's potential saving of PV materials, Louise was mentioning. Uh, so lower cost, less PV, less weight, and replace it with a very lightweight, cheap Fresnel lens. We'd like to put a second cadmium telluride payload into space, perhaps uh, using the uh, low level concentration, also testing the back contact structure, uh, maybe have a module architecture. And we'd like to look at uh, deployable, deployable strategies. So how can we take advantage of the potential flexibility of this uh, cover glass? It has a bend radius of about 50 millimeters. So you can roll it up and un for really good stowage density, and then you can unroll it when you get into space. I'd like to just um, show you the depth and breadth of the activities that are happening in Swansea University. Uh, regarding space research. So there's our cadmium telluride work. We have some perovskite work looking at space application and HAPS. We have some work looking at sensors. We have groups looking at uh, array deployment and debris removal, all the way through to the geography department looking at Earth observation. And we're working with a lot of um, well-known industry partners in the space sector. So if you... Um, are looking to collaborate please please drop me a line and i'll try and put you through to the right person in swansea so finally to acknowledge uh, the team from the center for solar energy research in swansea the university of surrey team craig underwood alex dyer and simran mahadi and mark baker and then from the algerian space agency majid abdul majid who's been uh, kind enough to take surveys from the outside nano you know seven years on since it was launched and uh, send us the data so we can keep producing updated uh, publications. And of course, the uh, funding bodies. Thank you for, for the money. And thank you all for listening. Thanks, Dan. So if there are any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, a quick question from me, Dan. Is the, are these uh, devices copper doped? These are the Arctic doped ones, Mike. Sorry? These are the arsenic dope ones. The arsenic, right? Yes, yeah. So this is our. I, I mean, we've we've been um, producing arsenic dope devices since uh, the early two thousands. Uh, finally, gaining some traction with the with the rest of the cadmium telluride research world. 
But yeah, these are the arsenic dopes. So that's probably one of the reasons you don't see any de degradation, right? Yeah, it could be. I mean, it's a polycrystalline material, so we don't get those same ionization issues that the uh, crystalline materials get. You know, we've got a fair amount of disorder in there and we're able to kind of accommodate this, this radiation. But the arsenic doping could certainly be helping, yeah. I mean, uh, two orders of magnitude higher potential radiation hardness than current technologies is, is a, big, uh, a big plus. And, and we need some big pluses because we haven't got the efficiency of the multi-junction solar cells. So we, we need to make wins on radiation hardness, lightweightness, and cost, low cost. Right. The other question I was going to ask was, uh, you're using this thin, is it flexible glass you're using? Yeah, that's right. Um, what, what are the optical properties of that? Is, what's, what's the refractive index? The refractive index is very similar to um, standard glass. So I think 1.5 and it's it's highly transparent um you can put so you've got 92 percent transmission i think of light but you can put ar coatings on there so you can bring that up to 96 percent um you, you don't you don't get a big gain from going from the three millimeters down to the 100 microns in transmission but it's very similar to normal glass in the way that you can add an ar coating to it and like i said the 100 micron version that we were using which is a fairly standard thickness for the for the kind of uh, environments we were putting this spacecraft into, it has a bend radius of fifty millimeters. So we've we've published a paper on that, and you can so you could effectively roll it up. And one great thing about that is you could start with a big roll of this glass, hundreds of meters long, and you could feed it through your production process, with bring your PV out to the side and, and roll it up again, stick it in the spacecraft, let you know, and then send it up and unroll it. Simple as that. Would you have to protect the back as well? That's a good a good point. I think you'd have to protect the back because uh, ultimately you've got to remember that these solar cells spend some period of time on Earth. You know, you make them and then they get transported to the launch site, which is quite often humid. So you do have to consider how these how these cells can um, can can last on Earth and then in space. Uh, but if it's as radiation tolerant as we think, then I don't think that we would need a radiation protection coating, perhaps just um, some Kapton, maybe some kind of polyamide film on the back to keep the weight down and keep the flexibility. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thanks, Dan. If you could take a look at the Q&A, I think we're going to have to move on to our next speaker. Yeah, we will do. Thank you. So I think, unfortunately, Nina Valinia from the University of Southampton couldn't join us today. So uh, our final speaker is Ian Cash from the International Electric Company. Over to you, Ian. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you can you see my screen now? Can now, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for in, inviting me. Yes, I'm Ian Cash from the International Electric Company. Uh, can I just ask a question? Are, are we having a hard stop at uh, four o'clock? No. no, we've got a... Um, we've got to, I'm sure we can take a few minutes afterwards. There's so I'll, many people asking questions. Yeah, I'll try and keep this moving along then. Um, so International Electric is part of the Space Energy Initiative. Um, currently showing on the website is about 66 uh, member companies and institutions. And we sit there and reliably inform there's actually about 76 uh, membership. So Cassiopeia, uh, it does stand for something. It stands for Constant Aperture, Solid State, Integrated Orbital Phased Array. And people may be familiar with the Cassiopeia constellation. And if you look up into the sky and, and see this, to the west, uh, invisible to the eye, is the Cassiopeia supernova remnant, which is the brightest source of microwaves in the night sky. And we'd like to change that. So common objections to space-based solar power, uh, Jeffrey Landis uh, covered uh, some of these. Uh, these are often uh, come across, secretly a space weapon. It's gonna be feeble and can't work. Uh, this is a, a often seen, um, is it gonna accelerate global warming because we're adding more power to the Earth's budget? And is it gonna be too expensive compared to wind and terrestrial solar? So in part, as Jeffrey covered, 
there is an atmospheric window which we need to be within and um, we want to be using wavelengths greater than three centimeters and less than 10 gigahertz exactly as uh, Jeffrey said on that and we are subject to diffraction physics so we'll try and operate at the regulatory peak which may be something in the region of 230 watts per square meter in the the center of the beam and that's around the quarter of sunlight so it's not going to be a very effective weapon it's going to have a similar warming effect as um, water strength of sunlight would have and regarding the inverse square law yes absolutely we are the subject of that but the point that most people miss is that if you make your apertures large enough you can actually intercept uh, almost the entirety of the power in the beam you're not going to convert all of that but um, um, we're certainly able to uh, intercept between somewhere between 83 95%, that 83 being the uh, typical area disk area. Um, it's worth putting solar power in perspective when it comes to Earth's energy budget. So the Earth's disk intercepts 174,000 terawatts of continuous sunlight. And since uh, pre-industrial days, we've added about 50% excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And rather than being in a state of balance, as is often stated, we're not. If you look at recent uh, period, there's about a 400 terawatt imbalance which is heating the, the Earth. Now, if you compare to what humanity consumes, 19 terawatt years, so a mean consumption of 19 terawatts over every year. And 84% of that is down to fossil fuels. So this 16 terawatts of fossil fuels is actually responsible for virtually all of this 400 terawatts of, of uh, imbalance. And we're forecast to uh, require far more power, you know, 50% increase by 2050, perhaps more. So every terawatt of fossil power, which we can replace with space solar power, is going to have this 24 to 25 times of benefit in not <laughs> increasing the, this imbalance. And if we exceed this and able to draw carbon dioxide out of the air, which is going to require an enormous amount of power, um, then we can start to reverse the effects of climate change. So remaining objections are, is it going to be too expensive compared to wind and terrestrial solar? So looking at intercepting one square meter of sunlight on the earth compared to doing that in, in space, um, using one of the best uh, panels uh, available today. This may be slightly out of date, but it's something of the order of 22.8% efficient. So if you're pointing directly at the sun, noon on a sunny day, you're going to create about 228 watts of electrical power. So looking at the mature concept for Cassiopeia, we're starting off with a higher initial power level because we're in space. We haven't got the atm atmospheric absorption. I won't go into too much detail about this efficiency chain, um, but we look that perhaps we could deliver about 255 watts on, on the ground. Now, um, mentioned that we've got the opportunity to use uh, concentrated uh, PV, and this example uses 500 times uh, less PV area. The mass of this panel, the, the amount of uh, mined and refined materials required, we're looking about 11 kilos per, per square meter. Well, what we're looking at for the mature concept is more like uh, 240 grams per, per square meter. And this is about 12% more power. So the question has got to be asked, is it worth doing all this, going to all this effort for 12% more power? Well, it's not about the power. It's about the energy which can be delivered over the year, and particularly the energy which can be delivered as dispatchable and baseload power, uh, which is where terrestrial uh, renewables uh, often suffer. So looking at the UK case, um, we have a definition of uh, one sun day, which is 1,000 watts per square meter for one day. And typically, the UK gets about 37 sun days in a year, compared to geostationary orbit, where we can look at 497 sun days in a year using this uh, same definition. So it's 13 times more solar power compared to the average in the UK. And with that power advantage, we're looking about 15 times more electrical energy delivered for intercepting the same square meter of sunlight in space. We have a choice of either maximizing the energy uh, per PV panel on the ground, 
And typically this is um, how it has been historically, where we have large areas of east-west uh, lying uh, uh, panels in, in uh, solar farms. And we have to cater for the winter case so that um, adjacent rows of panels don't shadow the, the ones behind. But that means in the summer, we've got about 75% of uh, sunlight, which um, isn't used by the, the panels, certainly used by uh, uh, the conversion by uh, uh, plants and, uh, and other things of that nature. Um, I just tend to try and maximize the amount of energy uh, obtained per unit land. And this results in a different configuration where we have a, a shallow east-west tilt of uh, north-south lying uh, panels. And uh, if anyone's uh, familiar with Isaac Asimov, um, if we carry on consuming power at the rate we're expected to increase, we're going to end up uh, coating our planet in an artificial surface of uh, PV to carry on and try and meet demand. So I'm not going to go into too much detail here, given the, the, the lack of time, um, but I've mentioned about the need for baseload power. Um, if we want to replace fossil fuels, we've got to have a, a source of power which, which can do what fossil fuels can, which is be available as much as you want, when you want, and where you want. And the key thing is that if we try and turn terrestrial renewables into uh, uh, this kind of dispatchable or baseload source, then we're going to need a lot just look at the diurnal uh, storage requirement, the day-night uh, storage, we're looking at about 100,000 tonnes of cells alone to produce one gigawatt of baseload power. And the predicted cost for that in 2040, using $2018, is about $4.7 billion. So I'm not even mentioning the, serial, uh, the seasonal storage requirement, which again is uh, huge. So We've had uh, historically a very high cost of space launch, and this is steadily coming down over the, the years. Uh, 2020, by some metrics, we could say it's down to $950 per kilo. With the advent of the Starship and these other uh, heavy list, fully reusable launch vehicles, we're likely to come down even further. In fact, um, in the mature case, we, we could probably bring this initial $85,000 per kilo down by three orders of magnitude. So that's a huge difference since uh, space solar power was first looked at in, in the mid to late uh, 70s and early 80s. So looking at some concepts, um, uh, initially I'll, I'll just uh, show uh, this concept, which um, can't deliver the base load power. So it's basically a sandwich panel with a phased array antenna on the Earth's facing side and PV on both sides. But the challenge is, if this is in a geostationary orbit around the 6 a.m., 6 p.m. local time, this panel is going to be edge onto the sun. So obviously can't uh, receive or generate any power and deliver any power. Uh, this concept, uh, uh, has received a, a lot of attention because it, it's certainly the best funded concept. It's had a, an initial funding of about $100 million in, in 2013. And um, you can see it, it uh, having PV currently only on the one side, it's actually in a, a worse situation than that uh, of the, the Japanese concept. Uh, for baseload, both of these concepts require significant battery storage. It's of a similar order of what you would need for terrestrial solar. Moving on, um, back in the, the late 70s, uh, this was the NASA reference uh, concept, which uh, Jeffrey Landis uh, uh, referred to. And more recently, the Chinese have um, updated this concept, overcoming one of the major concerns of this is that you've got a single two axis rotary joint. Um, so the later concept separates this into multiple rotary joints. Um, so we haven't got a single uh, point of failure. But you can see when you look at a specific power, we haven't gained a great deal over the years. We're going from around 98 kilowatts to around 100 kilowatts per, per ton. Uh, that's delivered power. Uh, back in the 1970s, there was a two sun uh, low concentration system, and that would have achieved around about 146 uh, kilowatts per ton. 
Sandwich panel concepts. Uh, the main advantage of these is that you're not getting the the mass out of the uh, electrical power transmission. You don't have to have electrical power uh, transported across a rotating joint. Instead, we're looking at ways of twisting the sunlight. And the sandwich panel, as mentioned in the, the earlier uh, Japanese and uh, concept, is uh, PV on on the rear side and the phased array. Uh, always facing uh, the Earth. Uh, the, this uh, concept from 2007 also has a single point of failure because these great uh, system scale reflectors have to rotate once per orbit for the stationary orbit. Uh, whereas uh, the John Mankin's SPS Alpha concept has heliostatic reflectors, uh, each of which is uh, independently uh, sun facing to put uh, sunlight onto the back of the sandwich panel. And we're seeing a big improvement in specific power from around the 100 uh, kilowatts per ton to more like 270 uh, kilowatts per ton. Looking at sandwich panels a little bit more. So here's a, uh, an image which shows the, the PV, power management and distribution in the central layer, and the microwave based array here shown in orange. And this is showing um, a geostationary orbit and just indicating that we've got the phased array always Earth facing as this rotates around the orbit. And you can see at the 12 noon case, we've got these reflectors putting concentrated solar onto the, uh, the back of the panel. Um, but in the 12 midnight case, we wouldn't, well, we'd be very rarely in Earth shadow because of Earth's tilt, but you can see there's direct sunlight onto the phased array side of this. So this is one downside that it limits the solar concentration to around about three suns. It's fairly low concentration uh, to stay within thermal limits. Sunlight converges from a wide and variable angle. So this is one of the complications of trying to use uh, high concentration PV. And really in this case, it, there's no easy means of, of achieving that, uh, particularly with the variable angles involved with heliostatic reflectors. And because it's earth facing, you've got this high inertia, the majority of the mass is contained in the sandwich panel. So if you try and put this into a highly elliptical orbit, um, Molnir would be even worse, but for, for an eight hour orbit, you're looking at something like a 25 to one ratio of the orbital angular velocity. So you'd having to be uh, speeding up the rotation, slowing it down, speeding it up, slowing it down every orbit. And that's gonna drastically increase your mass if you find means to um, handle that uh, momentum conservation. So to describe Cassiopeia, you can start with the sandwich panel, separate it into segments, then pull these out into a, a helical structure. And you can see here, the gaps between the layers are where the phased array sits. And another thing this does is by turning it 90 degrees so that these layers are edge onto the sun, and using uh, fixed 45 degree reflectors to bring sunlight down from solar north and up from solar south, we've actually got twice the aperture now. Uh, so we've, we've got two circular apertures looking from solar north and from solar south. By using a fixed uh, system scale reflector, we've eliminated the need for bearings and, and motors, et cetera. We haven't got the excess reflector area, which would be needed in, uh, for example, the SPS Alpha design. I mentioned doubling the solar aperture. And because we haven't got the direct sunlight, um, here it looks as if the phased array is fairly solid. Actually, most of that's just going to be vacuum spaced. So we can actually increase the concentration to around about four suns at the system level without uh, hitting the thermal limits. Because we retain collimation, uh, sunlight's always coming from a very narrow angle, uh, equivalent to the, uh, uh, the subtended angle of the sun itself, about uh, 0.5 uh, degrees. And this allows us to take advantage of high concentration uh, PV without what you would see on the terrestrial case where you need two axis sun trackers. The whole satellite uh, always faces the sun. And because of that, we don't have the momentum constraints. This will work very well in highly elliptical orbits, which I think will work a while. More on the solar concentration. So this, again, is looking at the mature concept where we have initial uh, two suns concentration from solar north and another two suns from solar south. But when we zoom in at a very small scale, we can then have 
another, say, 250 times concentration down to the millimeter scale trips. And uh, the whole point about the Cassiopeia design is it remains sun facing, and instead it might be the sphere of uh, the azimuth around the, uh, the helical uh, phased array, and also a degree of uh, elevation steering as well to enable it to, to target the rectenna. And uh, more on the uh, fact it's sun facing, some people sometimes struggle with this. Uh, are we? Oh, my animation doesn't seem to be working there, but so uh, given the shortage of time, I'll move on. <laughs> so that that animation uh, would have shown uh, more clearly how the how the concept always remains sun facing. Uh, these should be animated as well, but they're not for some reason. Uh, but this is showing the three different uh, variants of the concept, which has three different. Uh, 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 variations on the system scale reflector, uh, going from the four sun version on the right to the two sun and even a one sun version on the left. We're likely going to concentrate on this two sun variant because technologically it's it's no more complicated than having the, the planar quadrant variant. And what this allows us is to give a uh, different uh, power from different orbits and this, these percentages down here show how by using a choice of perhaps two fixed frequencies, if these are available, we can vary the amount of power that's delivered in the around about five to one ratio. But what I wanted to point out is the specific power that can be achieved from each of these concepts. So here's with a quadrant planar around 660 kilowatts. The full planar, we should be able to get up to around 800 kilowatts per ton. And an, in a mature design, potentially we could reach even one megawatt uh, per ton. So much higher than the, the earlier concepts I, I showed. Orbits, a uh, lot of people are, are considering geostationary. Um, I've also mentioned polar orbits, but rather than trying to deliver power uh, to say an equatorial band or other places for the dawn dusk, here I'm highlighting that there actually is a market for the South Pole Station. Uh, maybe even um, Arctic stations uh, as well. So even though we've got the same 14% utilization factor, which uh, Jeffrey Landers pointed out, there is, it's, the, the economics are good, but there's a potential economic case uh, for delivering power instead of shipping Arctic diesel, uh, flying it in and then shipping it overland in, in the Antarctic stations. Uh, this is another interesting bit. Uh, this tends to appear to break the rules. It's a highly elliptical orbit, it's at a low inclination, and it's sun synchronous, but it's also a prograde orbit. And this was figured out by uh, John E. Drain, um, and that has some advantages. Uh, if we go to a four hour highly elliptical orbit, this is at the normal inclination angle of 63.4 degrees. And here we can start at about 180 megawatts. And this is the first time when we can start to see base load power being able to be delivered to one region. The eight hour orbit is similar in many ways, but this is highly economic. Each satellite has got a utilization factor of about 75%. We only need four of them to deliver simultaneous base load power to three rectennas uh, spaced at roughly equal longitudes uh, around the planet. And finally, geosynchronous orbits and geostationary orbits um, here is where you start to get into the multi-gigawatt regime. The design for Cassiopeia, as for SPS Alpha, will be hypermodular. Here it's shown being assembled by free flying robots. The likelihood is we're more likely to use uh, crawling robots because we don't have to then worry about running out of propellant. And zooming in on these modules, here's where you can see that the phased array is mostly just uh, vacuum spaced, and these uh, layers are very thin, we're aiming for millimeter scale or less and edge onto the sun. And what I can't show from this one static image is that the PV is on both sides. And this is showing uh, an example using uh, one sun or concentrated, uh, sorry, <laughs> unconcentrated uh, PV, uh, which would be very amenable to some of the advances which have been made in, in thin film photovoltaics such as uh, 3.5 and uh, cadmium telluride. So trying to meet the requirements for commercial space power, well, 
launch costs, I would say, are already viable. Uh, main reason is because we've got this high specific power uh, for the satellite concept. Uh, our target is to achieve one megawatt per ton in a mature system. Utilization, we can go up to, uh, this is utilization on the ground, We right up to 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, there's uh, no eclipse outage for the eight hour uh, highly elliptical orbits. And um, one of the problems has been, how can we start smaller? Here we can see that we can start at the 180 megawatt level. And we're gonna benefit from mass production using a small number of mass produced uh, module types. And we can operate in these multiple orbits. So uh, try to keep that uh, as short as I can. Uh, there are some supplementary uh, slides if anyone wishes to, but otherwise I'm happy to take some questions. Thanks Ian for a great talk. Um, I've got a quick question. Uh, so you seem to be um, homing in on uh, some kind of concentrated system. And I'm just wondering whether the, the, the increased complexity affects uh, the success of the installation. And I'd also ask, does that also include uh, more difficult maintenance? So uh, you would have seen from the zoom in on the module that we're actually agnostic to PV. So equally, we can switch between using high concentration, uh, low concentration, and no concentration PV. Um, but one of the main complexities that's often uh, discussed is the complexity of sun pointing. And with Cassiopeia, that effectively comes for free because it is a sun reference system rather than an earth reference system. Unfortunately, the animation didn't work for some reason uh, just now, uh, which was a, a shame. I could have more dem easily demonstrated that. Um, other issues with uh, concentration, as you reduce the linear dimensions, um, the volume of cover glass comes down to the third power rather than as the, the square for large area for low sum uh, BV. And that means that we can actually have a greatness thickness of uh, cover glass acting as our secondary optic over our small PV chips. So we should get better uh, radiation protection from that. Another question about uh, the Molnir orbit that goes right through the inner Van Allen belt. The particularly the eight hour and four hour highly elliptical orbits I showed, they are what is called a leaning orbit. And they actually skirt around this inner Van Allen belt. And because of the loiter around apathy, they actually spend most of their time in an environment which is more benign than the geostationary orbit. So would, overall its lifetime would probably expect a, a lower uh, radiation environment. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Vadesia Raza. I want to ask about issues you mentioned about Japan's concept of the solar power satellite. Yes, yeah, so uh, because it doesn't have any uh, heliostatic reflectors at a system scale or micro scale, uh, it's basically a flat plate uh, concept. So the phased array always has to be earth facing to deliver the microwave energy to earth. And unfortunately, the PV, which is on both sides, for parts of that orbit, the PV will be edge on to the sun. So it's not going to be receiving any power. So if you want to have um, to, to meet the requirement for base load and dispatchable power, the only way of doing that with these kinds of concepts is to have uh, battery storage on the ground. Um, it'd be infeasible to have the level of battery storage actually in space. So I'd say these are non base load uh, systems. Thanks, Ian. Probably got time for one last question. This comes from Richard Padden. Given the phase development approach, how could regulators be assured of beam safety when using non-stationary orbits? So I mentioned that uh, the beam in many ways is inherently safe. Um, it would exceed current regulations in the, the center of the beam. But if you compare it to things like um, the RF dosage, you would encounter having an MRI scan, a full body MRI scan, the 230 watts per square meter is actually around about half that that you would uh, have um, during an MRI. So the medical establishment would uh, regard this uh, in those terms as being safe. The only real issue with um, non-modulated um, 
narrow band microwaves such as these is the heating effect it has. And typically for MRI, you're looking for no more than one degree body temperature rise um, over, I think it's a 30 minute uh, period. And uh, aircraft, um, birds, everything else will be passing through this beam uh, a lot faster than that. Um, Jeffrey mentioned that there was a study on rodents. I've also come across studies uh, performed on birds, uh, starlings, I believe, uh, back in the 1970s. And I think it was an 18 week period where starlings were four times subjected to 230 watts per square meter. And one morning, uh, the experimenters went looking for the birds and couldn't find them. It was a cold morning, and they did discover that they'd crammed themselves into the microwave horn to keep warm. And no other advert. Uh, th these uh, experiments were also done in wind tunnels, so the birds were in flight, and uh, no adverse effects were ever encountered. Well, that's good to hear, Ian. Thank you. Well, I think somebody else has asked if your slides would be available. And uh, if they are, I guess they would be available on the Super Solar website. Yeah, certainly. I'll, I'll make the slides available. I'll, I'll send them uh, to yourself. Thank you. Now, uh, Imimatsu Mitsuri would like to say a few words. I would ask him to keep this to a minimum because we are over time. So over to you. I'll stop sharing. I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you very well, but can, can, can I have uh, five minutes or not? Five minutes maximum, yeah. Okay. I want to, um, what is that? <coughs> Can you see my presentation? Yeah. Okay, this is, uh, I'm Mr. Reminds me from JAXA. I just happened to join this uh, uh, seminar. And uh, this is what I presented a long, long time ago, 2007 or something. Uh, we call our system SSPS, which stands for a Space Solar Power System. And uh, this time I show the uh, skip, 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 skip. Yes, um, we developed a dual junction synchronous solar cell, not for SSPS, but uh, for general use. But this is good for uh, SSPS system because it. Um, lightweight and flexible and high efficiency and uh, so high specific power so this is very good for i think this is good for ssps as well and uh what i was i presented this time is an uh, in our case uh actually we are uh, thinking of two systems one is a uh you know microwave beam power beaming system and another one is a laser power beaming system the latter one, laser power system, uh, we don't use a solar cell or power generation on orbit, but uh, just use a uh, light pumping laser power system and the beam down to the earth. And uh, we use a uh, uh, single junction uh, solar cell on, on other receiver. And uh, it's very easy to design a cell because it's, you know, one single, um, wavelengths so we can get the high efficiency high efficiency maybe as high as 50 or 60 percent on the ground okay what i did was that i compared the two candidates of solar cells the one is in gap gas germanium 35 triple junction solar cell and the other is c what we call cigs kappa indium bound diselenide much crystalline same from solar cell very similar to uh, Caltel. And uh, this is our schematic uh, cross-sectional structure of the two cells. And uh, this is a good, this is a case of a um, triple junction cell. Uh, good thing is high conversion efficiency as high as 30% at under M0 and a high radiation tolerance and a high, but price is high. And but the voltage output is high. This is good for you know high power trans, uh, transportation because you can get higher voltage and lower current. Uh, this is case of CIGSL. It's a low conversion efficiency, but, but this is very high radiation tolerance or so low air radiation degradation, and the price is low, but a low current output. 
that uh, if we apply them uh, high high concentration ratio concentrator system, we can improve the conversion efficiency. Uh, this is only for the case of triple junction cell. Uh, we can get the higher efficiency due to the decrease in effective internal loss and a high radiation degradation because uh, due to the shield effect by optical devices that lens or something, and also cell cost goes down. So the comparison of uh, this comparison of a uh, efficient change in efficiency as a function of concentration. I mean the left hand side. And uh, we demonstrated the uh, uh, in gap gas to junction cell and also CIDS cell using um, our uh, MDS one demonstration satellite, uh, which flies in good geostationary transfer orbit as uh, for about four hundred days, which is almost equivalent equivalent to 100 years in geo. Uh, you see that in the case of CIG cell, there's no degradation. And uh, even in an in-gap gas, your junction cell, which is not designed for space, but this is terrestrial design that still have a very high remaining factors. So we can use both, uh, I, both of them. But I just, at that, that, that time that the uh, um, concern was, uh, you know, uh, material consumption, I mean, resource of indium. So we assume uh, a two gigawatt system on, on orbit. Uh, we, uh, we, uh, this is the, the table of my assumption. In the case of CIGS, 50% efficiency, uh, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the triple junction with a high you know, concentrator system. Uh, the results shows that uh, in the case of CIGS cell, we consume 24 tons of indium. While in the case of triple junction with high concentrator, it's only seven tons. At the time, two, in 2003, annual production of indium is 295 tons, and the estimated world deposit is 200, no, 2,500 tons. So it's okay. All, all both are acceptable, which is my, my uh, conclusion. And uh, then uh, we compare. Uh, we compare. I compare the the, the two cells. And uh, superior, inferior, superior, inferior. So uh, I think it both is okay. That is my conclusion. And uh, still, we are continuing uh, the study on SSPS system. Uh, if you have any questions about our activity, let me let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Risan. <laughs> uh, we I'm sure there'll be questions in the Q and A. So perhaps you could answer them there. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, that that brings uh, things. This webinar to a close. I'm sorry if we've, we've run over slightly. Um, I think we've had a fascinating insight into what we would have regarded as uh, science fiction a few years ago. I'd like to thank all our speakers for giving us such great talks and a really nice slide with great graphics. And I want to make uh, I want to make a special thanks to Jeffrey Landis for getting to his computer very early in the morning and beginning with such a great talk from, from NASA. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my colleague, Christopher Malins, who's done a great job on organizing this seminar. And I'd also like to thank Martin Salto, the Space Energy Initiative, for all his help and encouragement to put this together. Thanks a lot. Thank you, that's, that's, that's the end.